So because Paul was talking about um, carbon, I thought I'd give a little overview of organic matter and then we'll end this off with a little talk about some uh, anions as nutrients in the soil. So talking about soil organic matter, um, what actually is soil organic matter? It is animal and plant residues in various states of decay. It's not just your plant tissue, the microbes that die in your soil. This earthworm will eventually pass away and it will become, um, it will become more organic matter in your soil. And so it's gonna include the living microbial biomass, whatever's living in your soil. The, the roots in your soil, they're alive. If you, if you pull roots out of the soil, say you take a soil sample and you send it into a lab for testing, it's not gonna differentiate. Let's say they use, uh, they can burn it in an oven and measure how the weight loss where, where carbon comes off. It's gonna measure the live roots and the live microbes. So technically soil organic matter can include anything living in the soil, even though for the most part, we're, we really talk about the, the dead portion in the soil. Um, we generally consider the older the carbon is, the more stable it is. Uh, there's some questions about how true that is, but older carbon is harder for microbes to break down. If it's stuck around long enough, we consider it to be more stable, whereas fresh organic matter breaks down easily. I always like to highlight with uh, people so they understand when we talk about organic versus mineral, if you, don't, if you haven't had chemistry in a while and you don't talk about some of this, What's a mineral versus an, an organic material? So anything that's mineral is considered inorganic. So it, any of these rocks here, uh, they, they're all minerals, quartz, sandstone, granite, uh, rocks, salts, and most of your fertilizers. If you're using chicken litter, yes, that's organic. But if you're using uh, UAN, potassium chloride, all those fertilizers are salts and they're all mineral. And so anything that's organic is what we call complex carbon molecules. And you use complex because carbon dioxide is a gas and has carbon. But for the most part, uh, all these bonds in here are carbon. So anything with a long carbon chain is considered organic. So that's the difference between mineral and inorganic. So the, this living tissue here, this living corn is an organic material. And all the dead residue is still organic because it has all that carbon in it. So there's a lot of different ways that organic matter scientists break down organic matter. It gets really complicated because it's hard to describe because if you think that you have microbes and earthworms and plant roots and all this residue and some of it's broken down a lot and some of it's broken down a little, it's very hard to describe what organic matter is. So they break it down. Uh, this is one of the simplest ways to do it. You have unaltered residues, leaves and fodder. So what we have on the surface here of this soil all this stuff here, that's unaltered residues. You walk through the forest, you see leaves. That's organic matter, but it's unaltered. And then it starts to be broken down by all those microbes in the soil. And we talk about soil health and soil biology, and they're feeding on this organic matter. They're gonna feed on this. And that's why it disappears over time. It's being broken down. You can't see them, but they're doing it. And so you're gonna have the fresh compounds, sugars, lignin, that your visible eye can't see, but maybe if you had a microscope, you could, you could take a look and, and see sugars and lignin in the soil. And then we have what we call the amorphous polymers. And amorphous means it has no shape. If you think of like an amoeba, it's sometimes the example I give for something that's amorphous. It, it doesn't have a shape. And these words you might actually know because some of the micronutrients you buy or some of the additives, they use these terms, fulvic and humic acid. So fulvic acid in the soil is organic materials that's water soluble, so it moves through the water. And that's why some of your micronutrients might be attached to a humic or fulvic acid, because it keeps it from bonding to the soil and it moves through the soil. So fulvic acids, really fresh material. You put out chicken litter, it's probably got fulvic acids in it. This corn, when it passes away, when it dies, becomes residue, it's gonna produce fulvic acids. So they can move to the soil. You have humic acids that only move uh, when your soil is more, a little more alkaline, say a pH above seven, so that it's not as mobile. And then human is the really, it's, it's stuff like lignin. It's not very soluble. It, it doesn't move in the soil. So this is the simplest way we can describe organic matter that I know of. But even though we talk about organic matter in soil, most of our ag soils are dominantly inorganic. A soil that would be dominantly organic is a swamp. Or even if you have an old lagoon that's dried out, an old um, like a swine lagoon or a dairy lagoon, that could be dominantly organic. But all of our soils, there's some organic matter at the top, 
but most of this soil here has formed from this rock. So it's, it's mineral. It's, the organic inputs are usually added at the top and within the soil from, from roots. So our soils form from mineral parent materials, but organic matter is going to be added to the soils over time through biological interactions. So your mineral material is going to be stable, but your organic material is going to depend on what are you adding to it and how long does it stay? How fast is it being broken down? Um, particularly plants and their roots. Roots are very important to organic matter. We see all the residue on the surface, but if you think about grasses and all the roots that they can develop in a, in a healthy soil and a healthy environment, those roots are going to die and they, they're really going to proliferate and add organic matter to your soil. How much is added depends on climate and topography, right? You have a, you have a good climate for growing crops, produce a lot of residue, produce a lot of roots, you're going you're gonna to end up adding organic matter. And then topography is how wet it is. Organic matter gives the soil, for the most part, it's darker color. So you can see the sand dune here, all sand, all quartz, not a whole lot of organic matter, maybe very little up here if we could get close. A highly weathered soil in Virginia, you can see some of that organic layer on the surface where we've had some inputs, but all this red, that's in our iron oxides. Same thing here, here's the Delaware soil. There's your organic material being added to surface, turning it a darker color. It's all those carbon bonds, all that carbon absorbs light and it makes it darker. And then if you, this is a forested soil in a wetland, you can see that shallow water table. You got a lot of inputs from all these forest leaves and you end up with these really dark colors. So the darker a soil is in general, the more organic matter it has. These are generalizations for simplification. There are in soils, in agriculture, there are always exceptions to rules, but in general, the younger soil is, the less organic matter it probably has because you have to have plants growing. You have to have inputs to increase your organic matter. So you, one thing you can consider in terms of the surface of soil is tillage can make a soil younger at the surface because you're breaking up all that formation. You can end up burning off organic matter. So you're actually making it younger through disturbance. And then sandy soils, uh, basically for the fact we'll talk about in a minute, Sandy soils cannot bond to organic matter very well. They can't bond to all those residues. So it's easier for microbes to get access and break them down. So it, sandy soils are very hard to build organic matter in. You know, if you have 2% of sandy soil, you're probably doing really well. Versus these finer textured soils where I know uh, some people who just do a little no-till over in a Piedmont soil and, and you can get four, five, six percent organic matter without trying as much because this clay will bond to it and hold it in place. You can also, uh, this was actually low in organic matter, this highly weathered leachable soil has high temperatures and you can have intense weathering environments like the Southeast, you can have low organic matter. So then where do you have really high organic matter? Well, if you've drained, if you have, um, if you're down in Sussex County uh, towards the beach and you have one of those drained swamps, well, sure, you've, you've got plenty of organic matter just off of Cape Hatteras inside North Carolina, the Pocosin region where they've drained those soils, lots of organic matter in their soils. But saturated soils, not great for ag, but the wetter it is, the harder it is to break down organic matter, you can build it up. And then uh, old floodplains too, this is an old floodplain. You can see organic matter build up in wetter environments because it's harder for it to break down. And then actually drier climates. If, if you've ever wondered why the soils, uh, as you get towards the Midwest, have so much organic matter, it's actually because those plains grew grasses, which had a lot of roots, and the roots broke down in the soil, and they built up organic matter. And it's harder to do, actually, with trees, because your leaf litter ends up on the surface, and you have larger roots. But you get a lot of roots from the grasses, and that's why those Midwestern soils are so full of organic matter. And um, and then soils with moderate wetting. So this is a sassafras soil. This is a state soil of Maryland. And um, we have this in this region. And you, you don't have as much of a weathering environment. You can add organic matter and it, it sticks around. You don't break it down as fast. The reason soil organic matter is so important, um, well, one of the number one reasons for an ag producer is it's something you can change. You can actually, you can deplete organic matter, but you can also build it up. It's not easy and it takes time, but you can do it versus changing the mineral material, sand, silt, clay, whatever minerals, if you have a sandy soil or a clay texture soil, you have to deal with it. But organic matter, you can manage, you can try to build it up. So it's very important as a food source and nutrient source 
for the biology in your plants. So organic matter can feed your crop and it feeds the soil biology. Uh, it can increase the cation exchange capacity. Organic matter has the highest CEC per weight of anything in the soil, but it just doesn't happen to make up a lot of the soil, as you saw from those images before. And it also helps bond, and it can really help you bond and produce aggregates that then, if you have aggregates in here versus this crumbled up section, it's easier for water to move um, down these cracks into your soil and roots to move down through as well. So to start with that first part of why organic matter is important, <clears throat> we have that um, soil biology, they have to eat just like us. And while we prefer to eat, um, well, we eat obviously animal parts and plant parts, they will eat on decaying organic materials because when photosynthesis um, built up sugars in this plant and built up carbon molecules, they added all these electrons um, so really it's the sun is the sun is feeding the crop, which is eventually feeding the microbes in the soil. So organic matter is packed full of energy. It has all these electrons <clears throat> in it from photosynthesis. They drop it onto oxygen. This is why soils consume oxygen, microbes consume oxygen, and they burn it off. They release um, carbon to CO2. Really what they're after is not as much the carbon as it's this energy reaction. They want the energy. That's their energy source. So the reason some of these soil health tests look at carbon dioxide is they're measuring the breathing of these microbes. As they eat organic matter, they produce CO2. So the more biology is active in your soil, the more CO2 you should measure coming off of that soil. So that's why CO2 uh, comes off of these soils. The opposite end of that, if we just make this a CO2, is that your plants take up carbon dioxide as their carbon. So they pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's part of the reason that we look at some of these carbon markets. If, if you're building up residue, you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere from these plants that are then adding it to the soil. So they're after this energy. The thing about organic matter is it's in a constant state of decay. It's constantly being broken down because those microbes are constantly feeding on it. If you have a low amount of organic matter, you have, a, you have a low microbial population. But as soon as you add residues, and you've seen this, particularly in warmer months, when you add residues, especially something with high nitrogen like uh, soybean fodder, how quickly some of that can break down. Or even over the summer, you might have residue at the beginning of the summer that by the tent the end of the cropping season, last year's residue can be gone, except for the stuff that has, we'll say, a really high C to N. So it's in a constant state of decay. So if you're not adding organic matter, over time, you're going to lose it. You reach a base level. It doesn't go all the way to zero because there's stuff that's harder to break down. And there's always going to be um, something, probably some kind of plant life growing that's adding carbon. But if you're not adding inputs, then you're not at least maintaining organic matter. So if we want to build organic matter, we have to try to, to maximize the amount of residue that we're putting into the soil. And then as much as we can, control the output. So you can, you can protect organic matter so much from microbes, but a lot of it has to deal with soil texture. Uh, so they're going to constantly feed on it, and you want that. Because as they're feeding on this organic matter, what we'll talk about in a second, is they're also breaking down and releasing any of the nutrients this plant took up. So this corn pulls carbon out of the atmosphere, but it's also pulling nitrogen, uh, it has phosphorus, potassium, all of those nutrients that it pulls up into it are in here when it dies. And so as they break down the carbon, they also release these, these nutrients out there. So if you want to maintain quality, so you can maintain organic matter in a soil, but the question is, what's the quality of it? Because if it's feeding microbes and it's constantly cycling, then you have nutrients being released. Your inputs have to at least equal outputs. If you want to build it, then your inputs have to be uh, above the outputs. A lot of this is driven by climate. More rain and higher temps typically means more decay. Again, not a solid rule, but this will work in most cases when describing organic matter. So nutrients are released when we have breakdown of organic matter. So they're released with breakdown. These are the terms you'll hear, especially when we talk about the nitrogen cycle. If you've ever heard the term mineralization, it's because you're taking this organic form of any nutrient and you mineralize or release it. So amino acids are an organic molecule and they're inside the soil organic matter. As 
the microbes break it down and break those bonds, they release it as ammonium. So that's what's released from organic matter first is this form of ammonium that can be taken up by plants. But the microbes, they don't just need the carbon. They're like us. They need a full suite of nutrients. They like the nitrogen too. So if you don't have enough nitrogen in your soil, as they're feeding on this organic matter, they will actually immobilize it. So that's where the word immobilization comes from, where the microbes might release nitrogen, but then they'll take it from you. And if there's not enough nitrogen in here, they will take whatever nitrogen you add to the crop as well, which whatever you fertilize with. So having a material that has the right C to N ratio is really important for agriculture, especially when you're talking about fertilization. So the release of this is governed by what we call the C to N ratio. And it's basically how much carbon compared to how much nitrogen. So when you see a number like 20 to one, that means this material has 20 times more carbon than nitrogen. You see 30 to one, it means 30 times more carbon than nitrogen. So if you think about a balance in nutrients, as that number gets larger, you have more and more carbon and not as much nitrogen. And if these microbes need a balanced diet like the rest of us, that's gonna cause a problem for you because now there's not enough nitrogen in that material. So the general number that we use is if you have a material, if you have chicken litter and you run an analysis on it and your it says your C to N is less than 20 to one, that's gonna be a net release in nitrogen. We know that it's a high end residue. Soybean uh, fodder can be like this too. And mobilization we know is greater than 30 to one for sure. If you have a material and you start into tree bark, things like that above 30 to one, then if you added that material to your soil, if you've also added nitrogen to grow your crop, that's when the microbes start immobilizing and stealing because they don't have enough nitrogen. Between 20 to one and 30 to one, either one could be happening. <clears throat> so these are the easiest numbers to look at. And the one you pretty much want to remember is that 20 to one. <clears throat> so this is, this is a table from a uh, soils book that just shows you, um, in general, these materials here that are less than 20 to one, rotted barnyard manure, alfalfa residue, undisturbed topsoil, they're all going to break down, they're gonna be food for microbes, and there's gonna be a net release of nutrients, particularly nitrogen. An undisturbed topsoil for every 1% organic matter might give you 40 to 60 pounds of N, might, if it has a high quality, if you've been constantly adding fresh residues. <clears throat> you can see corn stalks here, 60 to one, so that tells you that corn stalks are likely to tie up nitrogen. Small grain straw, 80 to one. Colon shale order, 124. Here's where if you want to build carbon in your soil, if you want to build organic matter, well then yeah, you add oak and spruce mulch. But if you're trying to grow a crop, this is going to steal your nitrogen at this point. So that C to N, it's, it's a ratio. So 20 times more carbon than nitrogen. As long as you're less than 20, if you get a, a test come back on any organic material, compost, anything that's less than 20 to 1 C to N, then you know that that should have a net release of nitrogen as it mineralizes. There is a question, and this is only one paper. It's not every um, paper in existence. This, um, this discussion was going on uh, online recently. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Poffenbarger is now at University of Kentucky, but she did some work over around Beltsville. She was at University of Maryland before. This is a study where they looked at um, soil organic carbon change with nitrogen application. <clears throat> so the question would be is, is nitrogen going to cause organic matter to break down faster in the soil? And because your corn crop is also adding residue, what they actually see is when you hit that correct agronomic rate, so this is probably in, I guess it's 100%. This must be in percentage. They don't, yeah, percent. Uh, so if you hit the right rate, so if you're going to grow 200 bushel corn, 200 pounds of N, if, if you nail that rate right, you pretty much hit the maximum. You won't cause a breakdown in organic matter. They actually see this increase as you're adding nitrogen in this system. Because when you feed the crop, when you feed the corn crop correctly, you're building residue, which adds back to the soil. Now there's a maximum it can take up. So if you have a degraded soil, you're gonna add more. Then maybe if you start adding too much nitrogen, if you over apply, then there's more nitrogen that might cause organic matter to break down your soil. So this is continuous corn, may soybean, because soybeans don't have as much residue, right? It's not as tall of a crop. It doesn't have as much carbon biomass to add back. 
you can, as you fertilize it correctly, and this doesn't mean nitrogen, but just fertilize regime, you, you meet that goal of staying close to 0% change, but it, it doesn't add the carbon in this one study like can continuous corn does. So if you're not at the optimum rate, um, you wanna make sure your residue in it is greater. And what they're actually seeing is if you over apply, if you think about nitrogen, if you apply too much nitrogen for the crop, your roots don't have to search as far, they might not grow as much. And that's some of what they thought they were seeing. If you over apply nitrogen, you get less organic matter because the roots aren't growing or proliferating as much. So again, one study, every soil, every climate would be a little different than this. Here is your third keyword, uh, cation exchange capacity, it will be CEC. And that it will be CEC. You don't have to write cation exchange capacity, just CEC. <clears throat> organic matter has all these edges on here. You don't have to memorize this chemistry. Just understand that all along the edge of this complex molecule, you can take hydrogen on and off of it. So you can have negative charges, you have positive charges, and you can see there is a whole lot of this on the edge of here. There's all kinds of places that we can have charge come on and off of this soil. You can also have areas that have no charge. That's why organic matter can also bond to some herbicides that might have no charge. So you got, um, you got these charges here that act like salts and they can bond with different things, nutrients, herbicides, same thing with this no charge spot. This is something that soils don't have a lot of, that organic matter does. It has these little spots that can bond to things that have no charge. Organic matter has the most CEC per weight basis of anything in the soil, but remember, there's not a whole lot of it. So you can increase your CEC with organic matter, but it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a large jump. The lower your CEC is, if you have a sandy soil, the more important organic matter might be to nutrient hauling. So the good news about it is it's something you can change versus your sand silt clay. <clears throat> this high charge helps it bond to soil minerals. This is why this is a point that we need to make and understand is how different it is based on the texture of your soil. Because you see the sand particle here. If you break it down into smaller particles that are roughly the same size, you see in between here, you have all kinds of additional surface. So there's more spots to bond to organic matter. So the smaller your particles are, as you go from sand to clay and smaller, the more likely it has more surface to bond to organic matter. That actually protects it and keeps microbes from being able to feed on that section where sandy soils don't have that. So it's easier to build organic matter, the smaller, the, the finer your texture is, the heavier your texture is. Um, soils are gonna aggregate. Sand, silt, clay wanna stick together, but organic matter, I call it like a duct tape. It can wrap through there and bond and hold on tighter. So that's the great thing about organic matter. So this is a soil that's been tilled quite a bit, but it doesn't take long, and this is our research station, to have these little aggregates form. It, they're not hard to form. The problem is, how strong are they? This is a soybean field from this year. Well irrigated, well shaded. You see um, what you're actually looking at in all these small particles is you're seeing uh, these casts from worms where worms pass through the soil and they actually can leave behind a residue that helps form some structure. But you see that barely a tap of my boot right here breaks it down. So organic matter can build, it can help bond soils, but it doesn't make it indestructible. It takes a longer amount of time of low disturbance to build stronger bonds, to build uh, stronger materials. And again, this is at Carvel at our research station. It's a sandy soil. It's just, it's not going to be as strong. Um, and the other thing is you have all these residues like these leaves. The great thing about earthworms, when you have um, what we call a healthier soil, when you, when you have biological activity, the earthworms pull the leaves into the soil so it can mix with the material instead of sitting on the surface. So a lot of what I see in some of our ag fields that are, are well irrigated, that have um, good crop canopy and stay cool enough and they have organic residues is you will see these worm casts at the end of the season, but a raindrop could destroy some of this. It's not the strongest. I think one of the bigger questions that we're starting to ask about organic matter is there's always been this focus on we need to build organic matter to have a healthy soil. And, and some of what we're seeing, particularly on Delmarva, when you have the sand, if you're going to feed the soil biology and you're going to 
keep nutrients in your soil and CEC, um, we're starting to, to look at it more as a pass-through living system. So there are soils that are easy to build organic matter in. A uh, clay soil is one, but if you have a forested swamp, it's no problem. It's easy to do. If you have a sandy soil, it's harder to do. So the question for some of us in our region with our coastal soils is, how should we look at it? And instead of just building organic matter, it's more about maintaining residue additions, maintaining roots in your soil, making sure some residues left so that you're that you're feeding the biology, that you're keeping organic matter added, instead of saying, well, I'm gonna to try to build this thing up to 6%, which might be impossible, it's still good enough if you're looking at it as a pass-through living system where, where we're adding materials to the soil, which can be, here. so here's a cover crop that we burned down really late. You see a lot of residue. Well, plenty of this is gonna burn off. It's on the surface. It's Remember, it goes to CO2, it evaporates. You have to have it incorporated in the soil and bond. But the more residue you have, the easier it is to build. So letting cover crops grow longer can be one way. You can build up residue like we did here. <clears throat> but you're not getting, all of this isn't going in the soil. Plenty of it's burning off of CO2. Um, leaving some fodder or chaff. I grew up in a dairy farm. You know, this was great bedding for cows. We bailed it up. But if you don't need it for anything, if you're not selling off your, your wheat straw for mushroom farms, leaving it there is going to allow it to add to the soil. And then, of course, manure is going to add carbon to your soil as well, where you can use manure. So besides adding in, it's also about maintaining soil organic matter. So reducing tillage, because when tillage breaks open in aggregate, it starts to feed the microbes. It's gonna go off of CO2, it's gonna evaporate. But what they also think, and I would agree with this, that some mixing incorporation is good, like no tillage is gonna concentrate carbon at the surface, but maybe some mixing, because we're not like a far soil, we might not be full of earthworms. It's having incorporation to get the carbon in, in some cases, not like yearly tillage, but getting, getting residues in every once in a while might actually help preserve it, but it's gonna be soil dependent. And of course, um, coming back to maintaining organic matter, the cover crops, if you have living roots, all the roots from this plant, the longer that crop grows, the earlier you plant it, the deeper the roots get, well, they're gonna definitely add to the soil. So that's a good thing there too. So that ends the little section I had on organic matter, trying to match up with some of what Paul talked about with carbon markets, because we're going to have a difficult time um, building a whole lot of carbon on our soils, but it's definitely possible depending on where you're at. I'm going to finish this up uh, talking about leachable nutrients on a project we had for Maryland grain producers, looking at anions in the soil. Organic matter is actually really important to anions. So your soil has a CEC. So it holds cations. That's why we always talk about calcium, magnesium, potassium. But the anions leach easily. That's why nitrate's a problem. That's why we worry about it with the Chesapeake Bay, because nitrogen is nitrate. It's an anion. Soil's negatively charged. Nitrogen's negatively charged. They're going to leach. It's going to leach straight through and pass by that soil. There are a couple different nutrients. Um, here's all of the nutrients that we need for corn or any crop. But on uh, nitrate, not ammonium, but nitrate, Phosphorus, but it bonds in the soil. Sulfur is important. Uh, boron, chlorine, we usually have a lot of. We don't have to worry about it. And same thing, molybdenum, we don't always have an issue with it. But we do have issues with nitrogen, sulfur, and uh, boron on the shore, especially with our sandy soils. So your CEC is a zone of negative charge that surrounds the soil. And that's where these nutrients that you add that are easier to maintain, uh, calcium and magnesium, that's where they're sitting most of the time. They're out here, bonded to the soil. They can come off the soil, and this is where plant roots take them up. The problem with what we call the bulk soil solution where the water is, the water that's out here is moving. So when you have a high rainfall event, this is where water's moving. So anything in this water is moving with it. All your anions are repulsed by the soil. So they're sitting out here and moving with it. This is why we split apply nitrogen. It can leach, it can denitrify, it can leach. Same thing with sulfur, sulfur leaches, boron leaches. That's why our soil tests don't do really well on sulfur and boron. It's, it's hard to figure out where they're at. Organic matter is important because it sits there and as it breaks down, it releases these. It's like a slow release source. So this ties back to why organic matter is important. So we had a research question because we had seen that nitrogen, sulfur, and yield 
were increasing together in different studies, but sometimes boron had an opposite relationship. If nitrogen and sulfur went up, boron was going down. We were looking at some samples um, across Maryland and, and Delaware. So we put in a project with uh, Maryland grain producers to look at just these three in a soil. And as anions, here's the other problem, your plant root, when it's taking up nutrients, has certain pathways. And some of these anions might compete with each other. Um, a big one you might be aware of, especially if you grow forages, is potassium and magnesium. When one goes up, the other one goes down. And it can be the same thing possibly with anions in here. So here's how we set up the study. Again, this was um, sponsored by the Maryland grain producers down here. They, uh, they do work. We work with uh, Maryland University of Maryland researchers, but they also, uh, Maryland grain producers definitely sponsor some of our work as well. So we set up six treatments, um, 230 pounds total N. We had one where we added a little bit of sulfur at the starter with n sol, just four pounds, not a lot, a little bit at starter, and then followed it with UAN. Then we added the starter, plus we added ammonium sulfate as a side dress, so about 18 pounds. So about 22 pounds total sulfur in this third treatment. And the difference when you get down to all of these is they are all of the same treatment, but we just add some boron. You see um, steadily increase sulfur to see what that does to nitrogen and yield, and then add boron to each one of these in a separate set of plots to see does boron suppress sulfur or nitrogen uptake like we'd seen in some studies. So to get right to it in terms of yield, as usual with a lot of our studies, we think we find something. It's one field, one study. Uh, this could be very different in all your fields. We apparently did not need sulfur in this one plot that we did. So you see a pattern here, but I've got no letters here, no statistical differences. Here's your scale, 242 to 252. I didn't put it at zero so you could see this pattern here that's in the crop. No statistical differences. It looks like yield drops off with additions of sulfur. That's what it looks like. But stats say no. And then this one looks fine with a little bit of boron. This one seems to drop and then picks back up. But this could just be what was going on in the plots. Nitrogen in the ear leaf. Again, no statistical differences. Also, I'd have letters here. You can see we go from about 3 to 3.3% 3 .3 nitrogen in the ear leaf. We took these at tassel. What's interesting is just like yield, you see the nitrogen uptake drop. So maybe that had an effect on yield that we, we just couldn't pull out in the stats. And it increases as we add boron. But I can't say that this is um, important because there's no, we had no statistical significance. So I couldn't say, well, adding boron with sulfur increases nitrogen in the ear leaf because we've seen the opposite in other studies. While adding sulfur here appears to lower nitrogen uptake, we had the same result in this study we've had in every single one. That 0.92 means that um, the 90% of the time, if nitrogen increases in our corn plant, sulfur increases in our corn plant. So they increase together in this study, even though it looks like adding sulfur depressed nitrogen. Um, in all the, when you include all the samples together, they both increase at the same rate. Adding boron, of course, there was no boron added in these, so we'd expect them to be lower. We did have a statistical difference here. So there was no boron added in these, so that's what we would hope, that there wouldn't be the highest. There is seems to be a slight increase. There's definitely more boron in this treatment where we added sulfur and boron together at side dress. Uh, the problem with this is each one of these has the same exact amount of boron, 0.05 pounds. It's not a lot. But for some reason in this treatment, when we added sulfur at side dress, we had more boron uptake. I don't know if this would, could repeat if we did it in another year in another field, but this is what we saw in this study. Sulfur has the same exact pattern as nitrogen, same exact pattern. So whatever affected nitrogen uptake affected sulfur uptake. And I'm really not so sure it's actually the treatments that we did. We have drone measurements. You don't have to know what NDRE is. Um, so the drone takes imagery and it's measuring the plant biomass from the pictures is all it's doing. So what's really interesting is in the imagery from July matches the final yields we saw, the same dip comes out in the yields. So whatever affected our yields was baked in back in July. And it could be our treatments because this happened after our treatments and I can't measure why, but it could have been there. Another thing I found interesting is this field stayed green a lot longer. And in September, all the treatments with sulfur, you can see by these measurements, 
they stay green a little longer than the ones that were just nitrogen or just nitrogen boron. Don't know if I can repeat this again, but it happened this past year that maybe, maybe in this case, sulfur allowed the plants to stay green a little longer. It's a small, minuscule amount. These numbers are very tight, but stats um, pulled it out a little bit on this project. So conclusions, I have a big question mark because it's a one-year study on one field at our research center. This would not apply to everybody's fields. Um, so we have lower nitrogen here, not statistically different, but it doesn't matter because the yield was still fine on this one. It was, it was about equal to, in terms of total value, uh, total yield, just having nitrogen by itself. So I don't think boron was, was, was causing a problem with yield, even though nitrogen was lower here. We did get more boron here with this treatment, but didn't have an effect on yield. So that didn't seem to matter. It really looks like uh, whatever we saw, whatever happened to these plots happened in July. And it could be this study. It could be these treatments. We'd have to repeat the study to see if it happened again. But there was something else that went on because we take these tissue samples and analyze everything that I wasn't expecting as much was um, there was a pattern with potassium where it appeared to increase as you added boron. And there was actually, um, that red doesn't work there. You actually see right here, this 0.34 isn't a very large number, but it says that potassium and boron increased in the plant together. And it says that potassium, nitrogen, potassium compared to nitrogen sulfur decreased. So what we were looking for was a competition between nitrogen, sulfur, and boron might actually have been an effect on potassium in the plant. Same thing, there's some kind of pattern here with magnesium that seems to match yield and potassium and magnesium play off each other. So while we were looking at competition between nitrogen, sulfur, and boron, we might have actually introduced some kind of competition with potassium that had an effect. And this is one of the first studies I've actually seen potassium and nitrogen have an opposite uptake in a crop. I wouldn't read a whole lot into this with one year on the study, but um, it, is, it is something that we saw in, in this study itself. So again, this was sponsored by Maryland Grain Producers. If we get to do another year of this, we will. And, and if you have any uh, interesting caveats or information on sulfur boron additions you've done in your field, we can only do so much in so many studies. And we certainly would, would work or look at any data that, that you guys have so we could learn more about what direction we should go with some of this, because I still think there might be something here.